Support for Digging Deeper comes from the Penn State Alumni Association. Connecting alumni to the university and to each other, the Alumni Association is powered by pride. Learn more at alumni.psu.edu. The Penn State Bookstore, now in an expanded location at the Hub Robeson Center. Improving the student experience at Penn State with philanthropic support for student causes throughout the university. PSECU, a credit union providing financial services to its members throughout Pennsylvania since 1934. More at PSECU.com. And from viewers like you, thank you. Can two weeks of summer camp have a lasting impact on how students feel about science? Researchers at Penn State are trying to find out by using genealogy research to get kids interested in science and increase diversity in STEM fields. In this edition of Digging Deeper, Penn State President Eric Barron will explore the impact of the Finding Your Roots summer camp. He's joined by Nina Jablonski, Evan Pugh Professor of Anthropology, and Michael Zeman, Director of the Student Engagement Network. I'll be back later on in the show to talk one-on-one -on -one with President Barron about the challenges facing the next generation of scientists and more. Now, here's President Barron. So thank you both for joining me, it's wonderful. Nina, I understand you have a PBS show with this is the title, mm -hmm. uh, professor who you're collaborating with. How did that collaboration begin? It began around 10 years ago and in the most delightful way, uh, Professor Henry Lewis Gates Jr. and I decided that we really needed to try to put our heads together about some new creative way whereby we could get kids interested in themselves, interested in science, and especially getting underrepresented minority kids engaged with the process of, of scientific discovery and being scientists. Mm -hmm. You were really thinking of that from the beginning of how these might go together? Yes, we were, because Professor Gates had been working for years with celebrities on self-discovery through looking at personal DNA and gene uh, genealogical research. And what he discovered was that people loved to find out about themselves. And he thought, if, if our adults that we are having on our programs love this, what about kids? Mm -hmm. And I said, what about kids discovering this, their ancestry, and using this self-discovery as the springboard to science? Mm -hmm. To me, it seemed like a natural connection, and it, we took it from there. It, and make, it makes a lot of sense. So if you're finding your roots and you're coming to the summer camp, uh, what do you do? What happens? Well, I think it's a a wonderful place for exploration for students to think critically and learn some of the basic skills of uncovering uh, more about their genetic history and their genealogy. Uh, there's a lot of activities written into the curriculum where they're examining um, how to be a good scientist uh, and why it's important to develop some of those skills. And they have a lot of fun at the same time looking in, in, in to the deeper scope of their 23andMe data. Mm -hmm. uh, and that really brings out some interesting results. So you walk in the door and they're giving their saliva to do a DNA or how does that, how does that part work? Uh, we work that out so that they do that ahead of time. Oh, they do it ahead of time because otherwise you wouldn't have the data process. Correct, so yeah. with their parents' um, um, oversight, they go ahead and send the uh, saliva sample in and they get the data back and they're asked to hold out until camp to look at the results so uh -huh. that it's a, a new experience when they arrive. So a lot of anticipation of what is my DNA going to tell me? Yes. yes. And do you think the parents are sort of working with them a little ahead of time thinking about their ancestry and what they know? I so, think in, in many cases, the parents are probably just as eager as the to kids. To find out, yeah. And they're, they're all anticipating this. The joy of discovery is 
critical here. Mm -hmm. And also the joy of kids discovering something themselves yeah. and feeling confidence that they can look at information and derive inferences from it. So the real key to this, to this whole concept is not only exposing kids to science, but allowing them to be scientists themselves, mm -hmm. to individually inquire into their own DNA, ancestry, their own genealogy, and many other things, to make mistakes in interpretation, mm -hmm. to learn all sorts of things, and to feel that they can do it. Mm -hmm. That is so amazingly it, it exciting. It is, so contrast it with a classroom that you might expect to have. If, if a young, young man or woman were taking a class in genealogy, or maybe that's not the course, but the topic of a, of a lecture, what would it be, how different is it? I think some of the traditional classroom methods of lecturing or instruction, uh, which you commonly see, are, are um, things that we've examined to try to move around inside of a camp program. So this camp program, uh, Finding Your Roots, is also designed to bolster or add to a traditional classroom approach to teaching these skills. So lots of hands-on, lots of activities, lots of group work. The critical thinking skills are important. Mm -hmm. um, Nina mentioned the one that I think is embedded in the Science U program, which is heavy role play. So actually uh, putting students into a role of CSI forensic investigator ah. uh, or a, a genealogist for the day or for the week, uh -huh. this really gives them a sense of ownership to, yeah, of I their see. own learning. And uh -huh. that's where we get a lot of those links to prior knowledge. So give me a CSI moment in finding your roots. What would you ask me to do? Well, I think uh, we have a good moment in the Anthropological Museum mm -hmm. where they have different bone structures, and uh -huh. there's a, a, a scavenger find challenge, and um, there's a, a bit of content knowledge and some uh -huh. uh, group work, but then you are set to task to uh, answer queries and questions based on um, physical structures in front of you and, and the history of uh, different bone structures. Mm, fascinating. So you decided middle school age was a good age. Mm. Why? This is really a critical age for kids figuring out sort of what they're going to do and where they are intellectually and socially. And it's a critical age for kids really feeling like, okay, I can do this. I have the potential to do this. It's also a critical age we know when a lot of kids turn away from science. And we want to get them in this formative time when they're forming their peer group relationships, when they're forming their ideation about what they can really be. We want them to think, yeah, I can do science. Mm -hmm. I can do science, and it's fun to do this. Yeah. And like, I can I can see myself doing it. So, we see this as really a critical time. It's not that high school or undergraduate years aren't critical, mm -hmm. but middle school is the crucible. Yeah, of time. you're starting to think about what what I might be. Yes, yeah. and we we are especially geared up not only to traditionally underrepresented minority youth, but also to girls because. We live in a world in which girls often are turned off from science. And mm -hmm. so we work extra hard to make sure that, that all of our youth in our camps are really engaged equally, that they feel actualized as scientists. Mm -hmm. And it's so wonderful to behold it, these yeah, young people. It, it, it is. So what does a middle schooler learn from their DNA? They, they learn a lot about their ancestry. Right. So they will learn in some cases that they have ancestry from, oh my goodness, a huge part of the old world or perhaps only one part of Europe or Asia. So they get an, a good idea about where their ancestors came from and how far afield their, mm -hmm. their ancestors were. They also, we, because we look at some specific genetic traits, they also can see that they are the same as or different from some of their friends or classmates mm -hmm. who look similar or different. So they might have similar responses to the bitter taste test, for instance, uh -huh. uh, and, and other simple phenotypic traits. So we have them study their ancestry 
and some specific traits related to bitter taste testing, height, skin color, mm -hmm. nothing related to diseases, but to obvious yeah. traits that vary between people. Yeah, and does, 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 um, does a student then come say, well, I, I look different than that person, but I'm much more similar? Is there that sort of sense of, of a, a group perspective on how? That is probably the chief wonderful untoward uh -huh. consequence or intended consequence is, mm -hmm. is kids realize that they are so densely related to one another. So even kids who have relatives from different parts of the world realize that they share tremendous amounts of their genetic heritage in common. Mm -hmm. And this, this is, I think, one of the most beneficial parts of this curriculum approach is that we introduce the concept of human diversity and human unity mm -hmm. constantly sort of toggling back and forth and mm -hmm. that human unity goes right back not just tens of generations but hundreds of generations as they talk about human evolution mm -hmm. and one of the structures of the the program the science you program that helps embellish this is to take the science home with you after the camp is done. So it might be an intense mm. week or two together, but what we found in this camp is on the last day, the families came in and celebrated the work of their child uh, in terms of a visual um, pedagogy display um, mm -hmm. of their choice. And the learning carried on. So to me, what they learn about their genealogy is the notion to explore and think deeply and more critically about who they are mm -hmm. and what it means to ask questions. Yeah. And so that's what I enjoyed seeing after the camp was over mm -hmm. even was a yeah. continued exploration of uh, w what did we really learn? And they would interview family members and come back at Thanksgiving and have these conversations and other holidays. I can imagine calling the aunts and uncles and grandparents and say, did you know? Yes. yes. I know yeah. something. I'm transmitting knowledge to you. You know, even in a college age, we're constantly talking about how do we go from delivering content to delivering a transformative experience. Yeah. Do you see the, the students transform right before your eyes? Well, I, I don't want to be a Pollyanna, but yeah. yes. Uh -huh. uh, and, and what Michael described as what we did on the last day, seeing these kids present their own research and their own genealogy and their own DNA to their families and friends was incredibly moving. Mm -hmm. We're also, as part of the greater research project, following these young people over time. Uh -huh. This is a research project. We're actually testing hypotheses about whether this mode of instruction is actually going to help kids be more interested in science. Uh -huh. And so we're following up with them and finding out what are you doing with this knowledge? And you have 10 years? Yes, well, we're, that's, we're hoping to follow at least some of them for 10 years, but uh -huh. most of them for three. And so this will be incredibly powerful data if mm -hmm. we can get you know, a fair number of these students through three years of follow-up surveys. Yeah. That will ask or that will answer many questions about whether this approach will be efficacious and whether we can begin to think about this, uh, applying this more broadly in America's classrooms. So are you seeking young scientists? Or are you seeking science literacy? Or are you see, what, what is, when you say follow and the impact, what is the impact that you're really looking for? I think all of the above. All of the above. Yeah, I think, so the science literacy is a critical piece moving into the middle school and high school mm -hmm. years, the confidence they bring back to their classrooms. That will perhaps prompt a higher fraction of those students to become scientists per se and to pursue the STEM disciplines in the college years. And we all know that it takes sometimes decades to create a wonderful scientist through higher ed, uh, but we need to open the gates wider to marginalized groups uh, and youth that wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity. Oh. And, and I think what it does for us is creates uh, a myriad of perspective on um, thinking about problems that exist that we wouldn't otherwise yeah, have. Might, might not have the opportunity, might not realize the door is open for them. Right. Yeah. For a talent and a set of gifts that they have and in terms of inquiry. And the science literacy is incredibly important. I remember giving testimony um, and, in, uh, in the Senate and getting a tour from 
the senator who happened to be chair, and he, and he wanted to see how a bill was going. Mm -hmm. And he said, you see all those people out there? There are no scientists. There's no one in here, but imagine all the complex problems mm -hmm. that we're having to deal with. And he was sort of pleading for some level of science literacy that would help people make decisions. And this, this is incredibly important for the, the growth of American citizenry. Mm -hmm. And when we think about creating you know, humans in this country who can understand science and who can critically look at arguments about global climatic change, energy use, you know, what, what's the best particular policy to follow in terms of immunizations or, you know, mm -hmm. diet. We need people who can critically look at facts and not be intimidated. Mm -hmm. And what, what was beautiful about this camp is that we saw young people begin to think science is something I can get my head around. I can yeah. do this. I can understand it. You know, I can create scientific data myself. Mm -hmm. And that change of perspective, like I'm part of this and I can understand this changes the whole nature of the experience of life mm -hmm. and certainly I think creates a, a new kind of responsible citizen that mm -hmm. is a marvel to behold. Mm -hmm. and, and back to your earlier question about transformation, on a smaller, shorter scale, the transformative experience is exactly what we intend to design in a yeah. one-week program. Uh, I wouldn't feel like we were doing a good job at uh, creating cognitive dissonance in youth yeah, yeah. Uh, if, we, if you know, they walked out the same. Yeah. Um, and so we video record the camps and assess them in different yeah. ways and try to get attitudinal shifts um, because, because of the importance of what Nina suggests. Yeah. Sounds in many ways from what I've read that this is a kind of a partnership. And so how does, how does a partnership work in a case like that? What does that mean when you, when you say this is a partnership? Well, and I can start and just say, in this case, I always felt like this was a match made in academic heaven. Uh -huh. um, we have... Um, How nice is that? <laughs> <laughs> we have a, a wonderful research faculty with uh, a career interest and a drive to make an impact, uh, a broader impact through research. And uh, we happen to have the infrastructure of a program that's uh, received great administrative support at the university. Uh, that, that dots I's and covers T's. And so uh, what happened was uh, in an a early meeting, years in advance, uh, the seed was planted and um, by merging the program and the, the research and the curriculum and hiring a wonderful staff yes. uh, of experts, this, this flourished and came to um, be one of the most amazing moments for these kids. Uh, to march through the curriculum, mm -hmm. but not just the students, uh, the campers, the, the staff themselves who are undergrad uh, students here at, at the university, they also experienced yeah. that learning along with them mm -hmm. how to, uh, let's say if you weren't gonna be a scientist, but you came in and helped mm -hmm. teach at a camp, you might cross the bridge to science education, mm. therefore yeah. not yeah. leaving the field. So there's yeah. a retention piece at play yeah. as well. Uh, wonderful. What about data that you're already getting a sense of how things are changing and you're changing with it perhaps, but do you already have some sort of conclusions that you're reaching well, it, based it on that? it would be premature to, uh -huh. to talk about our conclusions because we're now in the process of beginning to analyze all of the rich video data that we collected last summer, uh, as well as analyze our survey data. Our preliminary indications are that this is an efficacious approach. This is an approach that, that is not only unique, we knew that, but that is also probably more successful than most mm -hmm. in getting kids attention and having them retain their attention and intention mm -hmm. to continue in science at some level in the future. Mm -hmm. The future surveys will bear out how long this lasts. Yeah. But we feel we're off to an empowered start. Yeah. So if, if, if really you see those changes occurring, is it partly also because you had a set of students that 
were eager to do this? They signed up for it? It's a, it's a good question. Yeah. We had a very motivated set of students mm -hmm. and parents in 2016. This year, in 2017, in our next series of camps, we're going to have a larger, even more diverse audience. I think we're going to be every bit as successful at, because when kids are in this space learning, it doesn't matter sort of who their parents are, what is what is going on mm -hmm. at home. What matters is what's going on there. Do they feel like they're confident learners? Are they being supported? And they yeah. will be. All these pieces, yeah. and right there including this piece of, of it's personal. So I am yes. really interested, so you're building off that is, is wonderful. Just here for one last uh, bit of wisdom, if you're talking to a parent of a middle school student, what advice would you give them? I would, I would tell them, enjoy opening your eyes to the world, observe the world like a scientist, and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I would say to give it a try. Go yeah. for it. Don't be afraid. Um, have fun. Um, play hard, with, work well with others. Think critically and mm -hmm. um, see what you can accomplish. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank what you a for fascinating topic. A pleasure. Thank you for having us. Next up on Digging Deeper, I'll talk one-on-one -on -one with President Barron about a recent gift to Penn State and more. President Barron, as you and your guests just discussed, Penn State spends a tremendous amount of energy and resources in getting kids interested in science and having students pursue STEM-related fields. So what would you consider the biggest challenges facing the next generation of scientists? Well, I don't know. There are so many big topics out there from... Uh, human health to uh, so many things involving technology that are going to require very smart people that are working together with other very smart people. Um, energy, climate, uh, supplying food to the world. Um, it's, it's a rich set of problems and not enough people working on them. Speaking of next generations of workers and scientists, I mean, I'm a recent graduate of the newly named Belisario College of Communications after TV producer and Penn State alum Donald Belisario committed $30 million to the Penn mm -hmm. State College of Com. What can the college do now that it couldn't do before with this money? Okay, so this is the way I like to think about it. If you have a good leader, the college certainly has a good leader and a history of good leadership, and you have the right kind of facilities, and you can bring in very bright faculty that are at the top of the game, you end up with an exceptional program. And then our students not only know that they're learning from the best and they're learning in facilities that are exceptional, but when they go out in the world, everybody will recognize that they came from the finest college communications in the land. So what did Donald Belisario do? He gave us a gift that allowed us to bring in a group of endowed chairs. This is a wonderful way to attract new faculty. A substantial portion of it that was focused on students and attracting students, uh, especially students who, who have challenges. Uh, uh, Don would tell you how important it was to have veterans in, in that group, but this makes it more of a land of opportunity and money to create a facility in the, in the Donald P. Belisario Media Lab. So here is an opportunity to take those ingredients to go from a great college to a truly great college. And, and that's what a gift like that's all about. You t spoke of that new media lab and it would be on campus now, correct? Correct. So it also brings the faculty together and facilities together. That makes for a mo more cohesive college. All these things are just great outcomes. A wonderful gift. Switching gears a little here, um, Penn State Greek Life has done a number, a number of great great things. But recently it's been in the news for some not so good things. You even penned an open letter to the Greek community saying there could be a potential end to Greek life if it continues, you know, the way that it is right now. So what would you consider the uh, state of Greek life here at Penn State? Okay, so Greek life is a powerful way to get a community. Mm -hmm. um, many, many positive things that are, that are associated with, with, um, Having, having that group and, and to be able to work, to work together and have that network as you gra graduate and to do important things like service projects, which 
um, uh, the Greek community is known for. All of these things are incredibly positive. The downside is that the drinking culture has changed. And many, many of our alumni will say, well, that wasn't the way it was when I was there. Yes, we would have a social. Yes, we would do that. And, and, and many other issues that come with it. Right now, we have owners of houses saying it's harder to insure them. We've got parents that say, you know, why, why is this happening, the, this um, culture of drinking? And unfortunately, drinking is associated with higher rates of, of sexual assault. We have community members that are complaining. And we have the worst of all tragedies that a student, student died. And um, so from my viewpoint is it's time to reset that behavioral clock, so to speak. And I think if we do so, the Greek communities will remain very strong. But I think if we fail to, we will slowly see them slip off as we've had now more than three, four organizations lose their recognition because of hazing or because of drinking, um, underage drinking. Uh, and, and so this is an opportunity to, to turn this back into what most Greek alumni believe is the powerful purpose. Thank you so much, President Barron. You're welcome. On behalf of Penn State President Eric Barron, we'd like to thank our guests, Nina Jablonski, Evan Pugh Professor of Anthropology, and Michael Zeman, Director of the Student Engagement Network. I'm Kayla Fish. Thanks for joining us. Support for Digging Deeper comes from the Penn State Alumni Association, connecting alumni to the university and to each other. The Alumni Association is powered by pride. Learn more at alumni.psu.edu. The Penn State Bookstore, now in an expanded location at the Hub Robeson Center. Improving the student experience at Penn State with philanthropic support for student causes throughout the university. PSECU, a credit union providing financial services to its members throughout Pennsylvania since 1934. More at PSECU.com. And from viewers like you, thank you.